If you haven't yet gone down the rabbit hole of graph neural networks, you're in for a treat. It's a super interesting subfield of machine learning that's starting to get a lot of attention and activity, um, some impressive results. One thing you may have seen from the Google Brain team is they use the molecular structure of compounds along with graph neural networks to predict their aroma and show that that significantly outperformed prior methods. And this is a really broad topic, so I plan to make a series of videos um, that cover the major themes to help get you up to speed. And in this video, I want to talk about graphs in general in the context of machine learning, and then cover a more traditional technique called label propagation to help build some intuition for how we can even use graph structure in a learning problem. Before I get started, let me mention I also have a mailing list where I make announcements for various machine learning instructional content that I release across a variety of platforms. And if you would like to connect with me or other people like you, you can join the machine learning Discord server. So I'll put a link to both of those things in the description below. make it concrete, let's talk about this in the context of a new account registration fraud detection task. So that means we're trying to predict whether a new account will turn out to be fraud or not based on the attributes it used during registration. So an example attribute might be the credit card number. Obviously it's relevant if a new account is registering with a particular credit card number that was used in the past by fraudsters. But we can't really categorically encode credit card number as a feature in our model because there's just so many of them and you see them each one very infrequently. So that would be a lot of parameters you have to learn and then it wouldn't generalize very well to the feature. So if you start taking actions on a particular credit card by shutting fraudsters down, they'll just move to a different credit card and then your model won't work well. So one way you might solve this problem is creating a new type of feature like the number of good accounts and bad accounts that have used this credit card in the past. And that can be thought of as being derived from a graph structure. For example, consider a graph where there are account nodes and credit card nodes, and an account and a credit card node are connected if the account used that credit card to register. And next, you can imagine that account nodes are labeled as either confirmed fraud or not. And here I'll color fraud nodes as red, confirmed legitimate as blue, and unknown as white. Then these features are calculated by following the edge from a, an account node to its associated credit card node and then counting the other good and bad account nodes that are connected to it. This describes a scheme for taking a graph and using its structure to calculate features for a supervised learning problem, but you might imagine that there's more complicated relationships that this scheme might not work for. So as an example, let's now expand our attribute list to also include the IP address. Maybe we have an account that's sharing a credit card number with a bunch of known fraud accounts, but it's an IP address that we've never seen before. And now imagine we have a bunch of new accounts that are using that IP address, but different credit cards. Since none of these new accounts have been marked as fraud yet, our aggregation scheme for that IP address would say that it's all good accounts and no fraud accounts and it would ignore the fact that the IP address has elevated risk because it's just a short distance away from a cluster of known fraudsters. We could invent some new aggregation scheme that solved the problem of this last example, but then there would be a different set of relationships that that didn't cover. And the larger point is that the graph structure can encode lots of interesting information. And although we can engineer features to try to extract it, it's hard to anticipate all the different ways that interesting signal can be wrapped up in the graph structure. So what would be great is if we had a learning mechanism that explicitly considered the graph structure. And next I'm going to dig into one such example called label propagation. The idea of label propagation in this context is that known fraud accounts in the graph send fraud signals along its connections. And known good accounts send good signals along their connections. And then for any given node, it collects all of the signals it's receiving along its connections and aggregates them. And then it uses that aggregate to update its own riskiness state. And this is repeated over and over until the whole system stabilizes. 
This might sound complicated to implement, but it turns out you can do the whole thing with a for loop and a couple matrix multiplication operations. Let's start by taking a look at the whole equation and then break it down into its components. So here it is. F represents our fraud, not fraud predictions. The first thing you notice is there's a time component, and this equation tells you how to get the next step using the previous step. And this is where the for loop comes in. At each iteration, you use the previous iteration's values as input. The update depends on two terms, and the constant alpha weighs the relative contribution of the two terms. The first term uses a matrix S, which encodes the graph structure and tells you which nodes are connected to one another. In this case, both accounts 1 and 2 are connected to CC1, and CC1 is therefore connected to accounts 1 and 2. If our matrix has both a row and column for every node in the graph, then we can put 1s in the row-column pairs that are connected. Here, our first row represents edges coming out of account 1, and we put a 1 in the third column because the third column represents connections coming into CC1. The next row is account 2. So we do the same thing since it's also connected to CC1. The third row represents CC1, so we put 1s in the first and second columns because those columns represent connections into accounts 1 and 2. Since our connections don't have direction, our matrix is symmetric, meaning the ith row is equal to the ith column. If your connections did have directions, like Twitter followers, then you wouldn't need to maintain the symmetry. To compute the first term, our S matrix multiplies the previous step's predictions, f of t. Since this is a fraud example, our F matrix will have two columns, one for the legitimate score and another for fraud, and there will be a row for every node in our graph. This is a made-up example, so let's make up some numbers. I've colored account 1 red, so let's set its scores as 0.1 and 0.9, meaning it's more likely to be fraud than legitimate. I colored account 2 as light blue, so let's fill in scores of 0.6 for legit and 0.4 for fraud. And finally, we don't have any opinion about the CC number, so let's set both values to 0.5. As an example, let's see how the scores are updated for the CC node. The S matrix shows that it's connected to both the accounts because there's a 1 in the first two columns. If you carry out the matrix multiplication, you'll see that to get its new legitimate score, it merely sums the legitimate scores for both accounts 1 and 2 to get 0.7. The S matrix acts as a mask to select which elements to consider in the sum. So likewise, the new fraud scores sums the connected ones to get 1.3. In other words, it just summed the F vectors of all its connected nodes. Next, we look at alpha. Alpha is a tunable constant between 0 and 1. When it's 1, you ignore the second term. When it's zero, you ignore the first term. The second term is itself a constant and represents the initial labels for each node. Fraud nodes might have labels like zero, one, and legitimate like one, zero. And unlabeled accounts, as well as all attribute nodes, are set to 0 0.5, 0 0.5. This term is the same for each iteration. For your labeled nodes, this is what keeps pumping in the ground truth signal on each iteration. Imagine what would happen if we didn't have this second term and we only had a small number of ground truth labels. Let's look back at the calculation of the first term, but focus on the update for account 1. Remember that unlabeled nodes have some uninformative constant values, like 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Without the second term, the labeled nodes would update their state by just summing up the signals from all its neighbors, which are likely to be unlabeled. Their original labels would therefore be washed out, and the problem would get worse with each iteration. That's where the second term comes in. Since it has our ground truth labels in it, we keep pumping this information into the network, which then spreads to the neighbors of our labeled nodes and beyond. The equation therefore updates the fraud prediction for a node based on its neighbor signals and the original estimate and the alpha parameter tunes how much weight we put on each term 
when making an update. It's also important to understand that the number of iterations determines how far a signal can be passed from a node. For a single iteration, a node can only send its signal to its neighbors it's directly connected with. But that signal is then used to update the state of those nodes, and on the second iteration, those connected nodes send a signal to their neighbors, and that signal had a contribution from the original. So the number of iterations puts an upper limit on the number of hops a message can travel. Great, so we have a mechanism for taking a graph structure and some fraud labels and using that to get new risk scores for unlabeled nodes in the graph. But what if we want to incorporate additional attributes that aren't encoded in the graph? So for instance, whether or not a credit card is prepaid. Well, one thing you could do is run label propagation to get scores for all your accounts and then use those scores as features in a downstream supervised learning task that use traditional methods. But how can we simultaneously use attributes and graph structure in a single learning task? Well, that's exactly what graph neural networks allow us to do, and that'll be the topic of the next video, so stay tuned.